Welcome everyone. Uh, today we will be talking about Tutorial 8 and Tutorial 8 is about deep energy-based models. Or more specifically, we will here look at generative models. So in the previous tutorials and also in the lectures you have often seen, we have done classification, regression, these kind of tasks. However, there is another one which is quite popular and also very important, namely the generative modeling. And that's something we will look at here. Um, in the next lectures and so on, we will also look deeper into more variants of generative models. So this is a big topic in the course. And we start here with the topic of energy-based models. What are energy-based models? So we will discuss first a little bit of theory. But in general, energy-based models have been popular before uh, the deep learning hype. Then uh, the interest went down, but now it uh, goes up again because they have shown a quite significant improvement over the years and now more and more training methods are published. So it's still good to know what is an energy-based model as this will become more and more important over the years. In the tutorial, as I said, we have two parts. First, we will discuss a little bit or review the theory again, uh, specifically for the generative models in the energy-based uh, domain. And then we will actually implement one ourselves and generate a few images. So let's first again here um, import our standard libraries. And we also have pretend models, which we download here below. If you have already seen the lecture, you can probably just skim through the part. But here um, I want to shortly review again theory. So in general, what is generative modeling? So let's take as example, we have a Cypher 10 data set with a lot of images. And instead of now classifying them into one of 10 categories, we actually want to learn how to generate new images or what is actually a likely image in the data set. Because as you know, the data set is nothing else than samples from a distribution. So for example, I have 100 samples of a class ship, but that doesn't mean that I now necessarily know everything about ship. Right? And therefore, generative modeling is basically from these samples learn what would be actually valid images. Um, if we take just Cypher 10, it, a model would, for example, then learn all possible valid images for all 10 classes. You can, of course, also do it class conditional. But for example, you would learn, okay, this is the distribution of images for the class chip, this is the distribution of class for uh, the car, and so on. This is the idea of um, generative modeling. It has many applications and many advantages. For example, when you actually learn all the details of the images and learn how to generate new data, if you do that well, you can actually also use that for, for example, improving classification models. Um, but you can also, for example, detect outliers. Right? If someone now uh, puts an image from a completely different class into your model, then you could detect that with a generative model. The question is, however, how do you build a generative model or how do you learn a generative model in general? Because as you know, a probability distribution needs to have two properties. The first one is that every possible image or every possible data point gets a probability greater than zero, so not negative. And the most important one is that overall images integrated or sum, depending on if we have integers or a continuous data form, it always have to be a density volume of one. And that is quite difficult um, in the sense because if you have a high dimensional image with 32 times 32 times three values, you can very already see that we can just take an integral or a sum would be even too much. So therefore the question is, how can we actually still learn uh, a generative model all through we have this uh, bound here? The idea is therefore, um, well, um, this approach, or how do you solve that, that depends then on the specific model you use. And the one we look here are energy-based models. So energy-based models are based on the idea that you have a network called E, representing the energy of an element. And you basically calculate a probability density by just taking the exponential, because when whatever your output of your neural network is, you push it to be positive. Right? And then you divide it by the whole volume of over all possible images. So here you see we just take then the integral of a sum over all possible values of x. 
And this way, we can ensure that actually if we take an integral over this probability density we modeled, here again, it will be 1, no matter what actually e, for example, is. Um, so there you see that if we have a new network, for example, which takes in an image, would push it through a network and has a single output. So this e function, this energy function basically takes always a data point and assigns one value to it, one scalar value between infinity and minus infinity. And this we push through the exponential and divide uh, over basically the volume of all possible images or all possible data points in our model. However, clearly there is a flaw, namely um, how do we calculate this integral? We have just said that uh, this integral up here is not easy to do and this down here is not actually simpler to do because you need to still uh, um, integrate over all possible data points. And especially if you have a deep neural network, you can forget doing that um, because if you could do that, you could probably already solve the network in one single step instead of SGD. So um, therefore you need to do a few tricks to actually learn it and look at it. So what you usually use is that energy-based models cannot directly tell you what is the uh, likelihood of a single point, because for this you would have to calculate this Z constant, this normalization constant. The alternative, however, is that you can still compare two images. For example, you can still say this image is more likely than this one. And uh, that's the whole idea of energy-based models. So energy-based models can then, for example, be used for anomaly detec uh, detection, that you have two images and then you see, okay, this one has a much uh, lower likelihood. Um, actually, it always means lower likelihood means higher energy in this case. Um, while the other way around, so if you have an image really from the data set, you expect a high likelihood um, if you have trained it, probably, which we will look at. So this why also the training objective is called here contrastive divergence. So contrastive divergence is the idea of that you now learn by comparing the um, energy between samples instead of just calculating this huge normalization constant. So in particular, you train your model still with a grains of maximum likelihood. So basically, if you take a data set, you always train your model to have a highest possible likelihood on the samples of the data set, because this then hopefully uh, helps your model to generalize over the distribution of a whole data set, even the samples you don't see. However, in energy-based models, you can rewrite it actually. So if you have here your um, negative log likelihood uh, objective, you can rewrite it as an expectation of the samples and the data set. Of your, gradient, uh, of your gradient of your uh, energy function minus the expectation of your own uh, learned uh, distribution and then the gradients for those uh, energy functions. So what does that mean? We actually train them by comparing the energy of real samples compared to energy of fake samples. So basically, if we have a model, during our training, just assume we we have currently a model. From this model we will sample and we will try to um, increase the energy of these samples. In other words, you would um, basically try to decrease the likelihood for these samples while increasing the likelihood of those uh, in the data set. And this way you do this balancing uh, which is shown below here. So if you have given just already energy function or probability density, so here f Theta actually represents for us the exponential of minus e, so on. So basically, the numerator up here. If that is your function, you would basically sample one element from your density right now. So for example, this point, because this has already a high likelihood. You then take an uh, example from the data set. For example, this is one point in the data set. And then you try to pull up the likelihood of the element in the data set compared to pushing down the likelihood of your samples data set. And this way, you change the curve to actually have high likelihood for the data samples while low likelihood everywhere else. This is quite beneficial and actually also works uh, relatively well. So you see that basically it goes with two directions. Um, 
However, you also need to consider, well, how do we sample? Right, so we have now always talked, well, we need samples. Um, where do we get the samples from? That's the next part. Before going to that, a short comment. So if you have here uh, this function, at some point, of course, your samples will be the same as your data set. So if you would have a perfect trained models, then these two samples are basically coming from the same distribution. However, when your loss is optimal, so when you basically have um, have got this balance between your model and the real data set, and therefore you converge to this point. Hopefully, if everything goes well. And how do you sample from the energy-based models? Uh, so there we use an algorithm called Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, and specifically the Langevin dynamics. So what do you actually do here? You, you start with a random pot. So as you know, as we don't have a likelihood, uh, the specific likelihood is hard for us to actually uh, sample from a model. However, what you can do is you can start with a random point, just randomly generate, for example, the images with pixel value between 0 and 255. That's completely uh, random, no specific distribution. And then you go step by step, push the data for your model, calculate the energy, and change um, and basically change the image so that the likelihood is increased. In other words, that the, uh, of that, of course, our uh, energy is decreased. So this way, you basically have a random, you start from a random image, put it through your model, get the score, calculate the gradients for the input to increase the likelihood, and change your, uh, your image accordingly, just a small step like an SGD, as you would do in your weights, and then you do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and then you see that you actually iterate up your uh, likelihood curve. So if we are basically looking here, for example, if you would start here, you would iterate up, for example, this hill, go this way, and then at some point you stop, and then you have a sample which comes close enough from uh, the actual distribution. And this is quite nice. Um, so this way you can uh, actually sample from your distribution if you also still have some noise uh, at each step, because without noise you would always converge to well, Optimus, and that's not something we want. We don't want to always go to the highest point. Um, however, this would be only a true sample with certain constraints. In practice, you can uh, be a bit more uh, relaxed here. You can just say, okay, we limit it to a reasonable number uh, and get there for samples which are reasonably okay. So as I said in this notebook, we will look at generative uh, parts of our energy-based models However, there are, of course, more applications uh, out there, especially before uh, the deep learning um, hype was going on. Um, there are, for example, you could also do object recognition or classification of energy-based models. Because then you can take as input actually a pair, you would take, for example, the image and a label, and you would predict the energy of it. And then you would change the label and compare the different energies. And this way you could actually find out which class is the most likely for this image. Uh, the same is actually how you could do denoising, or here called image restoration. So you're given two images, or you always learn when two images, one is the noisy one, one is the clean one, and you, during training, you try to increase the likelihood of this pair. So you would, for example, take always clean images, put Gaussian noise on it, and put it for your model, and always try to increase the score. And then during testing, you would put in a noisy image. For example, start here with Y as well as your noisy image. And then do the same as we do in sampling. So you would improve this two sample here by increasing the likelihood until you get, hopefully, then a reasonable uh, sample. This way you could, for example, denoise images or learn to denoise images. However, for the sake for also the, ne uh, the next lectures that are coming, as they are all about generative models, we will look at here actually a generation. So how can we, given a data set, learn to actually generate new images for this data set?